Welcome to The Turnaround. I'm Skirtso, musician, YouTuber and Nicole Kidman impersonator. Today we'll be looking at the Gibson Les Paul and what makes it so great. The greatest, in fact. When I first started learning guitar, I played an old Yamaha classical style thing until my brother, who worked at a Chinese restaurant, saved up and bought me an Australian-made guitar called a Challenge, which looked a whole lot like a Gibson um, The Paul. Uh, the thing is awesome, and I still have it and play it to this day, but I don't take it to gigs anymore because, to me, it is irreplaceable. When I was younger, I'd pick it up and I'd have premonitions of myself playing the real thing a real Les Paul. Uh, I knew they were expensive, especially here in Australia where everything is taxed, especially musicians because we're good for it, and instruments because the government here likes to discourage the arts via all means available. Um, so throughout my career as a player and teacher, I held off on buying one until I thought I'd earned it and done enough gigs to justify one. Then I realised that I could make more money as a bass player as they are in fact in high demand in Australia than guitar players who are as ubiquitous as pigeons and almost as lacking in parasites. No, I can't play like Les Claypool, but I can look like him. No, that'll be fine. I can I can supply my own long johns. Thanks very much. Did I know Jerry was a race car driver? No, I didn't, but tell him I'm happy for him. Fortunately, a drummer I know came up with an alternative way to earn money before I did something I'd regret. Apparently you only need one kidney and people will pay a premium for them. That turned into something of a misadventure, but it all worked out in the end. Even dying twice on the way to hospital and needing dialysis each week to stay alive, my Les Paul studio is totally worth it. Perhaps the best thing about it is, of course, the tone. Every guitar has its own sonic character that it has come to be associated with. And you can hear the unique voices of Les Pauls on classic recordings such as the Beano record by John Mayall and the Blues Breakers, uh, Led Zepp 4, I think, there's a lot of that. And of course, Appetite for Destruction, all these played by Clapton Page and that guy in the top hat, um, respectively. Then there's the scale length, which is a fraction shorter than that of Fender Instruments and still fits all the notes in. Gibson doesn't skimp on those, no way. Furthermore, the shorter length from nut to saddle means that two notes that are a bit of a stretch on some guitars fall under the fingers much more easily. Of course, the notes that are right next to each other are no easier no matter what instrument you play. Hmm. Yes! next greatest thing about the Les Paul is the headstock. Look at that gorgeous inlay of the Gibson logo. Acrylic or abalone, or at least it would be if I had more organs I could live without. Turns out they took out a lung too, and that silkscreen print is all you get on the studio. Some aficionados of the brand can tell you what year Les Paul is from the logo and the smell of the lacquer, so I'm told. I don't know if that's true. I bought this one on eBay for a steal. If anyone can come up with a date for me, I'd appreciate it. It looks a bit different from its photos. No matter, because the logo is just cosmetic. This silk screen one suits the stripped down, rough and ready image of the studio over some of the more blinged out Lesters out there. Nevertheless, the Gibson logo, whether it is an inlaid mother of pearl job 
or acrylic or simply this silk screened ink, it represents an assurance of quality and craftsmanship of the highest order. The headstock also sorts the men out from the boys, uh, tuning wise as the G-string can bind up in the nut groove and can trick up even the most seasoned players. Check out Willy Wonka playing Crazy Train at Ozzy Osbourne's birthday, or, or, or what have you. Um, some, some poor guitar tech got fired for that one. Then, of course, there's the headstock and, and neck intersection. Undoubtedly, it was, it was designed to encourage that the guitar is always handled with the utmost care and respect which is entirely unnecessary in my opinion because who could possibly be more careful with expensive items such as guitars other than guitar players. The most amazing thing about the Les Paul is that it has exactly the right amount of knobs. Two volumes, two tones and nothing else. No preamp, phasing, switch chicanery here. Just just a moment. I didn't know it did that. Um... See, you see, after even after like a couple of years playing these things, they can still surprise you. Probably the most incredible thing about the Les Paul is that there is one for you no matter how bloated your bank account might be. You can spend over a grand or hundreds of thousands of dollars on them. Even the likes of Bezos and Musk and that Budo guy uh, with the airplanes could while away their hours evading tax and outbidding each other on reverb for rare bursts. Can they have a burst on reverb? I don't know. Uh, I haven't seen one, but I live in Australia, so who knows. Let's not forget the pickups. Obviously the greatest thing about the guitar. Uh, the voice of the instrument, if you will, where the wood is, of course, the soul. So over the years, the Les Paul has sported a variety of pickups, from the much-emulated PAF humbuckers to P90s to mini humbuckers, burst buckers, dirty fingers, uh, and others that... I'm just too lazy to look up on the internet. No matter what tonal characteristics you are chasing, there is bound to be a Les Paul that will fit the bill. Unless, of course, you want a Stratish or Telecaster-ish or Ibanez-ish or Gretsch-ish or, or Yamaha-ish or Jazz Box-ish type of thing. If that's the case, I suggest heading over to Fender's or another guitar company's web pages for a sticky beak there, and they'll sort you out. Right, now that the noobs have left, Les Pauls are the go for all those in the know because of their superior pickups. I really like the sound of the old T-tops. When I pluck up the courage to sell my corneas, I hope to buy uh, a Les Paul with, with them installed on it. Uh, this is because the only way you can improve on the Les Paul is by having more of them. And this holds true for most guitars, actually, and might go some way to explain the high divorce rate among guitar players. If not the pickups... And the best thing about the Les Paul has to be the scratch plate. It protects the top from scratches, so it's not just a catchy name. Uh, the best thing about the scratch plate is with a little tinkering, it is optional. This allows the inclined Les Paul owner to age the guitar top as nature intended, as nature intended through heavy picks, overlong fingernails, and general carelessness. This brings us to the thing that makes the Les Paul the greatest, the lacquer. It's nitrocellulose, I, I think, uh, which is a cool name because it sounds explosive because of the nitro. It's also comparatively soft as guitar finishes go, so it dents instead of shattering when it gets hit. This makes it relative, relatively easy to repair, I'm told. Um, it also contributes to a phenomena that if it is not unique to guitars, I'm going to say that it is because one should not let the truth get in the way of a misinformation video. Um, to allow that would be to, to fly in the face of rock and roll itself, wouldn't it? Um, I'm talking about finish checking, of course. Be sure to always use that term too, finish checking, not finish cracking. Finish crack sounds like there's some sort of issue or deficiency in the lacquer or the finish. Finish checking is a term used by guitar aficionados, collectors and salespeople to describe a pattern of aging in the finish of an old instrument that can add hundreds of dollars to the price. Just have a look at Gibson's website if you don't believe me. Another term to watch out for is patina, which I think means surface damage and scratches, but it's often used in such a way that makes it sound like the guitar has more character or personality. Kind of like a man who's been scarred by some kind of industrial or accident with acid or something. Um, although 
in that case, I guess the, the person has a story, but the instrument doesn't really have one. But it looks like it does, which is very rock and roll. Um, still, there must be a market for this kind of thing because a lot of guitar companies have professional guitar mutilation departments and their instruments are sold for a premium under the auspices of being relict or cosmetically aged. And if you're into that, that's great. You know, fair enough. Whatever your feelings about relic guitars, the best thing about the Les Paul is the tone woods that they made a mahogany body under a saucy maple cap carved to perfection by the truest of true artisans. Of course, the junior and the special models don't have a maple cap, making them more affordable. And depending on which side of the fence you fall on in the tone wood versus pickup debate, uh, makes them not so much a different animal, but mutants within the species, perhaps. Um, and they, yes, they have p90s in them too for the most part I'm, I'm given to understand uh myself i have no idea if the wood makes any difference to the sound and it's not a debate i care to participate in as i'm neither a physicist physicist or an audiophile i just know what i like the look and the sound of uh, plus this is the internet and there are a lot of angry people out there that might write something mean in the comments and hurt my little feelings um especially if they perceive some kind of slight or challenge to their version of the tone narrative. So let's move on before the trolls cancel me or whatever it is they do nowadays. Actually, to cancel someone, you actually have to be popular. So, so I'm good. Um, now, as my washing machine buzzes in the background, let's have a look at the neck. The Les Paul of some of the greatest necks in all of guitardom even when mishandled deliberately, most likely by jealous and spite-filled bass players, the Les Paul has a neck to suit any hand. It's just a matter of trying a few out and seeing which is for you. There are great big thick ones and wee skinny thin ones and a bunch in between. Myself, if I had the chance, I'd grab one with a volute, as they are supposed to offer a little more strength at the head and are thus more likely to thwart any four-string slinging troglodytes. Speaking of troglodytes... Uh, which, as I confessed in a previous video, I am one. Troglodytes are also what the host of the greatest Les Paul channel of them all refers to his viewers as. If you want to know anything about the Les Paul, his channel is a fantastic resource. Just search up Trogly's Guitar Show. Uh, if I knew how to link things, there would be a link in the description. Um, he does occasionally review other brands, but Gibson are his bread and butter, and Les Paul's feature more heavily than you know, Led Zeppelin 4. Um, the greatest thing about the Les Paul is the aesthetics. This thing just looks like a guitar should. Shapely and seductive, yet at the same time buff and butch, reminiscent of Sarah Connor in Terminator 2, or at least in a very effeminate Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, this is also bringing us to the sound. Plugging my Les Paul into my Rivera Pubster, or my big old Fender Jewel Showman, or Little Spark Amp even, makes it sing like the sirens of the Iliad. Its tone is sexy and hypnotic, which is a worry because if the wrong hands got hold of it, it could be used for evil. Even with its dormant potential to bring about a zombie apocalypse, the Les Paul is simply the best guitar in the world, and you should rush out right now and sell everything you own to get one. Anyway, that's about it. If I've missed anything, let me know in the comments. I, I will read them. It's, it's not that hard because not many people watch my videos and even fewer comment. Making this is, a, this is you know, a pretty good hobby, really. Today's episode was brought to you by the alternative reality album No Sleep Because of Tinnitus by Motorhead. <laughs>